The Appalachian Trail conjures up images of nature, extreme elements, and willpower. Every spring, thousands of people begin a quest at the start of the Appalachian Trail, either at one end in northern Georgia or at the other end in central Maine. Their goal? To hike the 2,200 mile long road, which winds up and down mountain peaks and valleys across 14 states. The quest takes most people five or six months total, and of the thousands that begin the quest, only a few hundred actually can finish each year. One of the most notable Appalachian Trail legends is Joe Stringbean McConaughey, who in 2017 shocked the hiking world by breaking the world record when he ran the Appalachian Trail in 45 days. That's about four months shorter than most people take to finish the feat. We were curious about what it's like on the Appalachian Trail, so we gave Joe a call and learned about injuries, near deaths, trail romances, animal attacks, and even the legendary Appalachian Trail Omelet Man. We talked with Joe recently before he set out on another adventure in the infamous White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here is the unedited hour-long phone call. All right, guys, so today we're lucky enough to be able to speak with uh, Joe Stringbean McConaughey, who is one of the most well-known Appalachian Trail hikers in the country. Um, I wanted to kind of get to know him a little bit and find out a lot about what it's like to hike on the Appalachian Trail and kind of get some insights from him. And I thought it'd be really educational and, and a learning experience. So Joe, thank you very much for talking to me, man. Yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so talk to me a little bit about you and, you know, your love of hiking, you know, how you began hiking. And then we'll kind of get into the fact that, you know, you set like a, a trail record and you're one of the most well-known hikers in the country. Yeah, totally. Um, so I first kind of got into hiking. Uh, a lot of kids, you know, grow up this way. who end up doing a lot of big backpacking trips like this, um, being just really interested in the outdoors. My dad uh, was our... Um, scout master and so he always inspired me to go out and I was an Eagle Scout and I was grew up in Seattle Washington there's just so much beauty and like accessibility to the outdoors and it was a big part of our life and so it was just awesome uh, you know getting out and exploring the Pacific Northwest and then I went to Boston College um, out on the East Coast and it was funny because I was I was running uh, like track field and cross country so I was a three sport athlete and I didn't really get the outdoors at all <laughs> for like uh, a good four years and then with uh with sort of graduation looming and um you know the th idea of going out and starting a job i was like man when are you going to get an opportunity to go on a big adventure and you know get an opportunity to go uh do some real hiking and so i ended up doing the pacific crest trail that summer which sort of hooked me um and sort of veered me back on the track of uh of continuing to to make hiking an important part of my life and now you know i love doing weekend trips you know hike the appalachian trail do a bunch of do a bunch of different adventures and things like that so um it's something that you know it's just is sort of who i am yeah man so get let, let's talk about your so you normally the appalachian trail i think it's about 2100 2200 miles long and it's a it extends from maine to georgia yep. and the normal person, it would probably take about six months for somebody to be able to do that. And you did it in 45 days to break like the world record, <laughs> correct? I did. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so yeah. So tell me like, so how, how did you do that? It was just crazy. That's a big question. Um, the Appalachian Trail is just stunning. It's, it's amazing. Uh, it has like about uh, half a million feet of elevation gain and loss, um, a little under 2,200 miles, and uh, just just amazing. I uh, how I did it is a t <laughs> is a big question, but um, and one that we'll talk about for the next uh, time or time we have here. So yeah, um, but doing it, you know, it just took a lot of dedication, a lot of foresight, a lot of planning, a lot of love, a lot of passion, a little bit of pain. <laughs> and uh misery for sure but um you know a million and one emotions and experiences all packaged into you know a, a pretty incredible 45 day journey yeah so what does that do so i'm i've never i've hiked you know a few miles here or there i'm not a hiker really i do enjoy the outdoors but um if i were to start 
and try to do this and I and my body's not seasoned for that what what types of things would that do to my body over the course of six months well, hiking up Asheville. and down these mountains you're in Asheville so you got all the accessibility to <laughs> the outdoors if you want to get into yeah, it yeah right <laughs> um yeah hiking up and you know definitely can take a, a certain toll on your body it's actually pretty hilarious um for you know gender wise of how people respond to the trail usually uh like women finish the trail and look just like stunning and gorgeous and like goddesses and they just have like fine toned muscles and then guys yeah. will finish the trail and they'll look like decrepit and gaunt and skinny and like they just got punched in the face and you're like what? yeah like homeless just, like yeah they strung just look out. homeless <laughs> so hiker That's trash awesome. is I, really popular pro- what is it called hiker, hiker trash, trash, trash? Yeah, so yeah. like hikers will have adopted the name hiker trash, where you're just kind of sort of like a play on white trash, I guess, where you're just hiker trash. You're not people can't really tell if you're homeless or through hiking. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I'm sure people are not shaving while they're hiking through, right? I mean, no. maybe. No, I yeah, very very few people who maybe are way too dedicated if they do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I imagine. So, so the beginning of it is somewhere in like Southern Maine ish. Yep. Right. Yeah, exactly. So you start, you start from, uh, well, it's actually, that's typically the end for most people. Oh, the end. Okay. So the beginnings in Georgia then. Yeah. It sort of depends, right? There's a lot of different ways people experience the Appalachian trail and other long trails like this. The classic which is kind of funny that there's like style, I guess you could call them styles. The classic style is don't going what's called northbound, AKA Nobo, where you're starting on Springer mountain and you're going up to Mount Katahdin in Maine. Um, and then if you're going Sobo, which is southbound, you're starting at Katahdin and finishing on Springer mountain in Georgia. Um, and some people do what's called flip-flopping where because of weather, because you know, it might take them six months, seven months, four months, um, they might start and do you know the southern section um, and start going Nobo, and then once they get to West Virginia to a place called Harper's Ferry, they might say, "Hey, I'm not going to make it far enough north in time before snow hits." So they'll literally flip flop and start from Mount Katahdin and come back to where they finished, so that they do the entire trail, but they sort of split it up. So there's a few different ways that people sort of experience the trail from that end, and then there's also this whole thing called section hiking, which is a which is a different uh, beast yeah. in itself, which is people completing the trail over, you know, years doing certain sections and just, um, you know, breaking it up into chunks. Yeah, the wimps, they can't do it all at once, right? <laughs> well, it's a very, uh, yeah, it's a very uh, divisive topic for a lot of people. <laughs> I was just yeah. with one of my friends, his name is, is Motorbo or Mobo, and he uh, he was just like, dude, section hikers, I hate them. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, hikers. right. Like you can't hate section hikers. Like everybody comes at you know a trail like this at their own pace and their own speed, and like that's some what for a lot of people like the only way that they can do it. And so, you know, to have that experience and be able to do the whole thing, like you're you're part of the community, and you're actually part of the community for a longer period of time than you are for someone who just hikes it in one season. So, um, you know, everyone hikes their own hike uh, is the, is the real thing. Yeah. So is so at the beginning is there like a you know, hey, welcome to the Appalachian Trail and like a little parking lot and like or is it just really in indescript? Like how I mean, is it a lot of fanfare at the beginning or is it just sort of like you just see people get dropped off with a backpack and they're like, See you later, honey or like how does that work? That's pretty much exactly how it happens. There's no no uh no hike like fanfare and hiking. <laughs> you just no, find it. There's no people you, cheering for you. I, I thought there'd be people cheering like on the side, like a marathon, like you can do it. Dude, I wish. Could you imagine? They're just like get a crowd of a hundred people at the start. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, you literally, for most people, they get dropped off in a parking lot. That's like a mile or a few miles away from the actual start and finish. So like you get to the start of the Appalachian trail by hiking up Springer mountain. You don't get to the start of the Appalachian trail by getting, you know, dropped off in some like start line that you might see at like the New York City Marathon where everyone's cheering you on and giving you high fives. And it's kind of funny for a lot of people because they sort of expect that kind of experience a little bit. And then very yeah. quickly you realize, well, like this is a wilderness experience. Like there aren't people in the wilderness or there are very few people in the wilderness. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So you have to hike to the beginning. Is that Dude, what you're saying? It's hilarious. You do. <laughs> <laughs> So when I did it, I was with my my dad and mom, actually. So I did have some fanfare. My dad and mom were there, and a 
love them to death uh, and it was actually super nice having them there because like I got to uh, when we got there you're literally just hanging out in like a little middle of nowhere town in um, like northern Georgia with nothing to do except like go to these really you know divey restaurants and other like cheap motels yeah. and things like this and so I was like if I didn't have company this would be the weirdest experience where I'm just like in the middle of Georgia doing I have no idea what I'm doing and then I'm about to go start this huge journey, which it's not like there's like a like a buzzer or like a there's like a little plaque on a rock on top of a mountain. And then you see what's called a white blaze, which is how the trail is marked. Um, and you see white blazes and that kind of leads you along the, the path and takes you forward. But the start itself, you know, feels a lot of times like it's unceremonious, <laughs> despite the gravity right. of what you're about to undertake. Sure. Yeah. So give me a quick rundown of like, um, I, I, I read that you had about seven pounds of gear. I think, I don't know if that's extra light or normal. Um, ultra like what light. kind of stuff do you, that's ultralight. Okay. Ultra so you were, cause light, you yeah. were running, I mean, you were literally, literally running for a yeah. lot of it. You couldn't like, so you could not have a huge giant backpack. Like I picture people that like towers above their head with like pots and pans hanging down. I guess that's, <laughs> that's not what people do with this. Um, yeah, I was a traveling I, family band on the, on the AT. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, what's funny is so my wife, when she met me, I was in California and down near the Los Angeles area, there's mountains near us. They're not very amazing. They're mountains. Um, and she came out there from the Midwest and she was like, oh my gosh, you have all these mountains. Do you hike and camp? And I'm like, no, like people down near LA, like we don't, <laughs> like if it snows, like we'll drive up there and throw snowballs for about an hour and then we come back down. Like we don't hike or we don't <laughs> camp. And she's like, oh my God. So she's like, let's go camping. And I had never really camped before. So she pulled up in her Jeep to like pick me up. And I had like folding tables and oh like God. a barbecue with wheels on it. And like, I mean, I had like all this stuff and she's like, what in the hell are you doing? Like there's tables and barbecues <laughs> at the campground and like, you don't need half the stuff. And I was like, Oh, okay. Well, all right. So she's like, just bring you and some hot dogs and some beer. Like that's all we need. That's amazing. So I, you know, it's completely like, and I think for most people, like if, if people were going to go hiking, they'd probably be similarly like, you know, Un, unknowledgeable about what they would need to take. Um, but like, what are some of the like must have things that you, that, you know, you may not know about, like when you first start hiking and then you realize like, okay, this is something I, I'm sure like butt chafing cream is probably something <laughs> that you need to have. I don't know. <laughs> well, they're going to back it up a second and say your wife already sounds like she knows exactly what, what you need to through hike, which is uh, which is yourself and a little bit of beer. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, man. Minimalism is like a big thing for, for through hiking because you're carrying all your stuff and you're taking every single step in five pounds or 10 pounds or 20 pounds, uh, adds up when you're taking, you know, millions and millions of steps. So, um, and it, it's all over the map, right? Like some people, there's some people who are so type A about their gear list and they're like, I want to have base weight of five. Uh, base weight is what you call your weight um, that doesn't include food and water. So kind of uh, the weight that can sort of fluctuate depending on when you get resupplies, which is when you go into a town um, or have a place to kind of resupply what you're working with. Um, so some people have like, yeah, I need a base weight of five pounds. I have the newest like um, sill nylon, you know, tent and sleeping bag and all these things that just make it extra light and easy to go like light, easy and fast. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you'll have some people there. I remember this guy who was carrying an REI uh, like three person tent in his hand. So he was hand, he had, what? this was actually, yeah, isn't that hilarious? He was hiking on the PCT uh, and he had not made it very far, but he was in the high Sierra. So he'd made it, you know, I forget exactly how high the high Sierras are, but they're in like the five, the 700 mile range so he'd hiked a long way carrying a like Huge not tent. yeah it was so fun i saw this dude and i was like what like how dude <laughs> and he's like oh yep this is just what i do like it's just and i was like wow like but you know you're doing it like you've made it very far and, and that's impressive in itself so people yeah. come from all different styles and have very different approaches to it but you know the key pieces are some kind of shelter so you need um, you know, rain protection, uh, and 
a tent. So usually that's like a, a fly, a rain fly and a tent. You need some kind of insulation from the ground. So usually that's a like foam pad or inflatable pad. Um, and you need a sleeping bag. Uh, and then some people will, people also approach food very differently. So some people will kind of go out and, you know, have a bunch of freeze dried food and, uh, and have just like really nice high quality meals, which is pretty amazing to see in the back country. Um, and some people just go without a stove or they're eating cold food for the you know entire five months, six months journey that they're doing. Um, then you have <clears throat> your basics with, you know, clothes, uh, which you try to have like one or two pair of shorts, one or two pair of socks. Um, do you wash your pe- clothes like while you're like in a creek or something? Like how do you in underwear? Like how do you how do you clean your clothes? You take a you take a nice quick hiker bath, which is okay. Essentially, jumping into a river and cleaning everything that you might need <laughs> to clean. Yeah, or you actually your like clothes and everything. Okay, exactly. So then you just or- walk wet for a while and dry off. Yeah, it depends on how you're doing it. Like for me, I would, uh, I would, the, the style I was doing it, I was trying to go extra fast and light and quick. So I had like one shirt, one short, uh, like one pair of socks. And I That's all you through. had was one, pi- one set of extra clothes? One set of clothes that I was wearing. And then I'd have a, uh, and then I'd have like, I had a long, like a l- very light jacket. Actually, it wasn't even yeah. a jacket. It was just like a long sleeve t shirt. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, that was pretty much it for me. Cause I was, you know, doing bare, bare minimum stuff. Yeah. It's a little yeah. maniacal when you really, when you get down to these details. So maybe we should just skip over them. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. But I can imagine. So, okay. So what are, what are just a couple quick things that, that you learned? Like, this is like mandatory, like that I needed that you had no idea you would need, but you realize like, I need to always have this. Yeah. So the biggest one, you know, what aquifer is. Uh, no, I should I, don't. I should be like a hype man for Aquaphor. It's just like a little like healing ointment kind of thing. There's a lot, you know a lot of things out there like that, but it's meant usually for like um, dry skin or like lips and things like that. I would literally, so I got bad bad chafing the you know the because it's so humid right when you're in Georgia you're like oh I'm like sweating yeah. through my shirt like you're out there for 30 minutes and you're soaked and then like you come into your campsite at the end of the day and you're soaked and you because it's so humid out and it's not that hot out at night, like your shirt's going to stay wet and you're going to put a wet shirt on in the morning. So like you just really have to, you know, in those kind of conditions, you really, you have to, well, there's two options. You have to suck it up or you have to have a second shirt. And I, I went the suck it up method. Yeah. Um, but Aquaphor, I rubbed that on my, like I got really bad chafing a few days in and then I just started putting this stuff on every morning, every night um before i went to bed and it just helped my skin heal so much so i didn't get any chafing problems after the first uh first few days actually which was a godsend because the chafing that i did get was horrendous yeah Yeah, i can only imagine um so what any any other any other quirky things that you always have with you that you um yeah i yeah i'd always have um like a, a must is like a water filter. So <clears throat> as Sawyer water filters are, are really clutch, which they just kind of, uh, there's a few different brands that do this kind of thing, but basically like you can just fill up. I would actually, I liked it a ton because they, um, the top would screw on to like a soda, soda bottle. So I'd literally just find used soda bottles, screw on this water filter on, and I could put that, and then I could like drink water from any water source. So <clears throat> I had two water bottles that, um, for like water accessibility, where I was just using like through hikers are always find the cheapest gimmicks and tricks to, to get by. And so yeah. I just use like, I just find a, you know, plastic bottle that was in a recycling can clean it out a little bit adopt it for you know a good two three weeks it would start to kind of wear down and break or things would happen to them so i just find another recycling can and get another water bottle use my Sawyer water filter on top of it and had you know clean drinking water the entire time and uh and got by which is which is pretty cool Mm -hmm. is there did do people's water filters like not work right and then they realize like i just drank nasty water and they get sick or are they pretty good like you can rely on those things you usually can, but, um, but you know, you're always going to find someone who gets, there's like, there's some people who don't really believe in water filters. They're just like, oh, I'll drink the water and be fine. Uh, and sometimes they are fine, but you know, people will get sick. And then very rarely if you're using 
if you're actually taking care of your water, it's very limited. It's a very limited chance that you will get sick. Um, but if you do get sick, it's like if you get Giardia or something that like ruins your entire hike. Yeah, so, you're done. You're yeah. Done. So that, so it's kind of one of those things I don't want to play with fire on. No. Do you ever see like diarrhea pants thrown on the side of the trail from people that got sick? Like just pooped poopy pants. <laughs> you <ever> see... <laughs> um, that's, is that someone's nickname i i hear that you guys give each other nicknames on the trail i'm sure somebody's oh, yeah. got named poopy pants yeah. i'm sure i didn't meet any poopy pants but they're definitely out there there was one guy named speed bump because he uh this is actually from when i did the pacific crest trail but a guy was named speed bump because we were hiking through the california desert literally the first day and this is right after there's um they used to do on the pacific coast trail this big uh this big like hiker festival before people started um yeah. but it's too much use on the trail so they don't really do it that much anymore but they uh this guy was hiking you know a few hundred people start all starting at the same time and within like 50 mile i think it was like 50 miles into the trail on like the second or third day he literally passed out on the trail and like had to he had like heat exhaustion and so people just walked right over him and called him speed bump no because of it <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah so what's the like so how many people so you take off i'm sure you see people like going each way i mean is it like do you go like days and you happen to see people you go fast so i'm sure you probably pass people more than you are passed but yeah how often do so, you see people out there? What's the like? What what's it like when you bump into people? Do people just wave and keep walking? Do they stop and talk? Like, how, what's it like out there? So there's this thing called it's called the herd and the or the bubble. And the bubble is essentially all of these hikers who, you know, maybe start anywhere from like March to May, and uh, you know, so a whole the the bubble sort of starts in April and then kind of slowly disperses over time. But then the may, like the later hikers who are going a little bit faster will catch up to them and it'll just be this kind of like bubble of hikers. Um, and what's cool about what I did and experiencing the Appalachian Trail is I started behind the the last hikers that left for the season and I caught the front end of the bubble. So I was one of the first yeah. people that finished in the season. So I saw the whole spectrum of all the different hikers that were out there. So, you know, I meet, I'm meeting people in like mid-June in uh in like north carolina who are like i'm really thinking i can make it to the finish and i'm just like in the back of my mind being like if you've done 15 miles like you need to do like 30 miles a day to finish like i'm like i don't yeah, want to break like you're the news never to gonna you. make it yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna happen and then you meet people at the front who are like gunning for it and once you tell them you're going for a speed record they're like oh you know i do 40s every day and i don't take any zero days a zero day is when you take a full day off the trail and then yeah. they sort of start to get into their kind of like big biggest mileage days that they can they want to share with you because they're a bit more competitive about it um but when you meet people that's just there's just so much camaraderie you know it's like you're all in it for the for the same thing um and trying to achieve the same the same goal just going about it you know at your own life's pace so there's so many amazing people that do uh the appalachian trail and the pacific crest trail and the continental divide trail um through hiking really is uh one of the most unique cultures you'll find in the u.s it's like it's the best way to see america in my opinion because you get you know retired folks who are in their mid 60s who have wanted to do something like this and now have the time and go and hike the entire trail you find kids just out of college who are like ah, i don't really know what i want to do with my life but i at least can like hike the appalachian trail yeah, do it now you know you you find people who like are in their 30s and have said like screw you know corporate america or maybe well maybe not screw but they could say like screw corporate america or like you know i've been burnt out like i'm totally doing a life change and like this is the start or this is what I want to do. I've saved up and now I can do it. So you meet people, you meet like Republicans, you meet Democrats, you meet people from the South, you meet people from the North, you meet people from the Midwest, you meet there's a fair amount of like a decent amount of international hikers. And so people who are like, oh my God, I'd never expected to be, you know, in the middle, I guess on the like North Carolina, Tennessee border, seeing a black bear um, is just so far away from, you know, what I'd imagined in, uh, in like Amsterdam that I'm like, it's just a crazy new experience for me and you could share that with them. So, um, and people, you know, there's, you're like, you're camping, you're in the outdoors, you're going to be disconnected from your phone. You're going to be, 
like in your own little world. And because of that, people are, you know, really excited to connect and hang out and like, you got to figure out a way to pass the time. <laughs> so you try to make it right. fun. Yeah. I'd imagine. So are, are there a lot of weirdos that people pass that you're like, okay, creepy guy, two miles back, everybody watch <laughs> out. like he, he's kind of, you know, clingy and doesn't really seem like he's right. I mean, is, are there dangerous people out? I'm sure there are that people have to kind of, stay away from it depends on your definition of weirdos <laughs> yeah um but actually they so it's kind of weird because um like really no, like the general answer is no to that question um at least i would say like you really find you find definitely some people who you know seem socially awkward or kind of aloof or like really free spirits um, or just people like, you know, you, you meet a huge variety of people. Um, I have never, I've met like a few curmudgeons. That's like the worst type of person that I've met where like, I was like, Hey dude, like I'm string bean. What's your trail name? And he's like, my trail name's Mike. Actually, I don't have a trail name. My name's Mike. I don't believe in, in trail names. Thank you. And I was like, yeah. Whoa, like this guy is really like, that's really aggressively mean. Like how have you hiked a thousand five hundred miles and you don't have a trail name and like anyway, t totally totally yeah. different side story where you just like run bounce into these people every once in a while that you're like, whoa. Um, but really like there's a lot of uh so like most people do it as a solo hike and kind of bounce in and sort of meet people along the way and hike with, you know, a certain cohort of people for an extended period. Um you do like the only thing that really comes to mind um, from an actual like s safety perspective is there's just like one really sad case where a guy who clearly had some kind of like mental illness came and there was actually like a murder on the trail, which is, which is really, oh, really crazy. Yeah. So that's the only thing I've really heard about in five years. So when you, I mean, you look at it holistically, it's like, that's a really small number, but it's still kind of shocked the through hiking community to hear something like that hype happening. Yeah. Do people ever like, do, do guy, like, you know, guy, male hiker meets female hiker and then they end up like hooking up and dating. And then like, I mean, does that happen on the, on the trail? Totally. Yeah. Yeah. All the time. There's like trail, trail romances are, are a very real thing. Like a lot of, and uh, I meant to mention this a second ago, like a lot of through hikers are just like solo girl hikers and they're like, I'm going to do this by myself. Yeah. And and they end up being totally fine. So I wanted to make that point. But um, yeah, I just had that guy motorboat. He uh, he has a his, he hiked with his sister. Hopefully, I'm not selling them out right now. But they hiked. They hiked. Just did the PCT. She met a guy from Germany, and now they are uh, and now they're like dating long distance. And she's gonna go visit him uh, in Berlin. And like I don't. We'll see how it plays out. But you know that kind of thing happens. There's uh, definitely people who like meet on the Appalachian Trail, get married. Um, you know, I, there have been cases of people meeting on the Appalachian Trail and getting married at the end of it, which is just psycho to me, but it happens. <laughs> I'm sure there's people that meet on the trail, get married, and then get divorced by the time they're done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we should be. Have you seen that show, 90 Day Fiance? Um, no, I, I probably parts of it. Is that is that? It's like a very sort of... trashy television yeah. show. Exactly what the name. Uh, the name suggests is basically like people get married or engaged and then 90 days later they're like this is a terrible mistake yeah. <laughs> i'm i feel like that has to happen but i don't know uh, who knows man love is a unique thing yeah yeah um are, so what's the etiquette so do you you so you're you're hiking are, there there's not always you know i'm sure there's plenty of places where there's like an established campground for for people to like go to like you've got your like stops where everybody there's a you know 10 or 12 people hiking in a general area but then there's got to be areas where people are just like you know what i'm tired i just need to throw a tent down right here yeah um what happens if you're hiking and then you're like okay i'm putting my stuff down right here and then here comes another guy and he's like i'm gonna put my stuff down right here and he's like you know too close you know like whoa dude like why you gotta be all right up in my business <laughs> How, what's the etiquette on that you can't be like hey this is my trail like get away or go go 500 feet away i mean you can't really tell people you can't camp by me or can you or yep. like how does that work 
Yeah, it's funny. It's like, well, usually, I mean, people are people are fr- well, people are friends and then become frenemies, and like you know, usual human dynamics play out when you have small groups of people spending a lot of time with each other. Um, but the the funniest thing is there are shelters all along the Appalachian Trail, um, and their shelters maybe I'd estimate every fifty seventy five miles, something like that, where it's an actual like three walled structure with a roof. Um, all just like wood and you can just sleep there and they're open to the public and kind of like it's a first come first serve basis um there's usually mice everywhere because people aren't the best with keeping their food and and mice can mice are very creative so like when i first this is a this will be a good example of how people use shelters like when i was first starting the at i the very first night i stayed in a shelter and there was this lovely couple who was just out on like a short backpacking trip talked with them had dinner together hung out um got to know them pretty well um they told me they like the guy brother wanted to do the at one day like had this great conversation which is very cool I keep going you know, the next majority of nights, I'm like staying by myself in a shelter because there's just no one around me. Um, I get like halfway through and I start to hit the bubble and there's a rainstorm and I show up to a shelter at like 10 p.m. and there are literally bodies on top of each other uh, in sleeping bags um, just on the floor of this place. And it's super crowded. There's like wet clothes hanging up everywhere. And I actually couldn't even find any space. So I had to just pitch my tent in the little small camp camps uh, campsite space um out in the rain and i just got dumped on and it was like the worst storm i've been out in but um they just sometimes they just get so crowded especially when there's when there's rain but it is like a first come communal first come first serve communal basis so people kind of are begrudging about it but they're like yeah like if there's space we'll like make space for you um which is kind of funny and, there, and you yeah. know it's any everything in between um i kind of the more I hiked, the more I had distaste for actually sleeping in the shelters because like you'd literally wake up and there'd be a mouse crawling on you and then there'd be someone snoring. So you kind of lose some of that um, wildernessy like self-independence that you have when you're just setting up a tent at a yeah. campsite, um, which, Sounds you like know, pretty much anywhere. You... LA. <laughs> <laughs> downtown LA or a shelter in the middle of West Virginia, you decide. I know. Yeah, but like, do people? So, do people just? I mean, are there people that just like, I'm tired, and they just put their stuff down and pitch a tent right on the trail itself, so that people have to like step around them, or is does that never happen? Definitely, yeah, definitely that doesn't happen. That would be that's for sure frowned upon. Um, okay. The the general there's usually so there's like, in addition to the shelters, there's also camping sites and spaces. Also, depending on where you're at, um, if you're in like, if you're on private land, like this is a no-no, right? Like if you're on private land, you're like camping at a designated campsite um, and you're not sleeping on some random person's or some random person's lots, just land in some some brush. Um, if you're in uh, like national forests, that's a different, there's like different rules associated with that. So sort of depending on where you're on, who owns the land, um, you know, you definitely can, if you're in like more backcountry type stuff, you can hike off the trail, set up a campsite. Um, you want to always be like 200 feet away from a running water source and especially be considerate when you're, um, going to the bathroom because that's like a big, big way to spread disease. Um, and you also want to be really cognizant of like use, um, all the rules that are set in place and most people aren't even aware of these things right um there's like all the different national parks have regulations and use for a number of people at campsites and that's because like experts have gone through they've done assessments they've you know determined that having more than 10 people at a certain campsite leaves too much of a human human footprint if it happens over a long period of time um so there's you know a lot of thought has gone into to human usage on these places, but often it's really not posted anywhere. And you like, you're probably not going to see anyone. So if you did set up your tent really late at night in the middle of the trail, no one would probably notice, but it is kind of one of those things that, you know, it's really important to be cognizant and aware of, um, which, which you might not inherently be, uh, it has to be one of those things you might need to learn a little bit or, or, uh, do a little research on. Yeah. Figure it out along the way. Do people, 
I guess do do people just build fires out in the op- like out in the open, like collect some wood and make a little fire and put their water over it and boil their food? Is that pretty much what they do? Or fires not allowed? Like if you're not it's, in a designated area? Yeah, um, they have to be in like a designated uh, like designated fire uh, pit or or spot there's big issues especially on the i mean like california wildfires right like you've yeah, heard a million sure. yeah so so like there's huge issues with fires um in certain parts of the country and even you know east it's in the east it's the same thing we don't have the same kind of wildfires but um they certainly happen and uh people people really take that seriously so people actually don't make a ton of fires um i don't they do it like usually if there's, if you're at like, a, that's one of the nice things about a shelter, right? If you're at a shelter, usually there's a communal fire going. People are hanging out, telling stories by the fire, enjoying each other's company. If you're at like a random campsite by yourself or with one or two other people, it's it's pretty rare you'd have a fire. Yeah, yeah. So what is a trail angel? Are these people that like hike and help hand out stuff to people and give them food and band aids or something? Or like what? What is a trail oh, yeah. angel? My, uh, if if anyone's listening and you're like this this whole community sounds like wacky and weird and I want to somehow like look at it on the inside without really, <laughs> without like without doing, doing that Appalachian yeah. Trail <laughs> yeah like that's like that's why a lot of people are trail angels and it's super fun I've been a trail angel a few different times basically what it all it is is there are people hiking uh, you can give them free food through hikers love free stuff. Uh, and you can spend some time together and hang out and sort of do a good deed for someone else um, and and maybe spend a little bit of time with them or help them out in the, in the way that they see fit. And then they go on their journey and, you know, you kind of have a cool, cool experience and way to engage with the trail. So um, my favorite trail angel is the omelet man. Uh, he oh, my God, he was the best. He was up in Massachusetts. What's his um, name? What did you call him? The, he was the omelet man. Omelet man. Oh, he was making omelets for people. It was crazy. He had this like professional. <laughs> it was. It looked like. It looked like a. Which, when you imagine like a fry grill, like um, he had like three huge like fry grills that looked like they belong in a restaurant. He, you'd literally show up and he'd say, "How many? Like how many eggs do you want in your omelet?" And you'd say like two, eight, twelve, like fourteen, whatever you said. He would make it. He had um, like chairs everywhere he had homemade cornbread he had uh tarps on top of everything he had um like dragged in he'd also dragged in a like wheeled charcoal grill which was the funniest thing to see um and he just had this whole little like it was like a camp it was like a base camp um and literally people would just hike through he'd you know ask them what they wanted and then he'd pretty much do whatever like you know he had all million different types of fruits he'd probably spend a lot of money on this stuff but it was just like everyone's favorite spot um and so people would go hang out for a few hours and just hang out with the omelet man they'd you know wait for their buddies to catch them um who might be a few hours back and just hang out and enjoy each other's company and this guy's and this guy's nice trail angel setup yeah was he near like a parking lot or did he hike all that stuff he couldn't have hiked all that he, in. he hiked dude he hiked it in it was like what? he I, he hiked it in like an, a half mile which i was shocked um if he was seeing i mean he did definitely was uh was illegal what he was doing <laughs> like i'm pretty sure someone told me actually later he ended up had like uh i think like a park ranger or someone like made him leave his his post um yeah like food but, violation i mean you know yeah right I mean, like you're, bringing but you're not an actual... buying it so it's not like you're a customer you know i yeah it's it's more like impact leaving like impact yeah, on the trail right. and uh and like cr- like grilling to the extent he was grilling and set up like not permanent structures but semi-permanent structures on like a on, like in the middle and on well like right next to and sort of on the trail um which was greeted by all the hikers but probably from like a uh, you know, park ranger standpoint, they definitely weren't excited about it. Yeah. Yeah. So what does it cost to, to hike the trail from beginning to end in food and whatever else? I don't know what else you need money for, but like, you know, yeah. what, what type of cost do you accrue? Yeah. The there, so there's like a slow cash burn and a fast cash burn. The slow cash burn is 
like being really diligent about hiking and like spending your entire trip on the trail um, and literally just like stopping in trail towns to get resupplies and going on the fast cash burn is when I mentioned zero days earlier. So when you like decide, Hey, I'm not camping today. There's like a really nice town. Damascus, Virginia is one of them. I'm going to go hang out, get some really awesome food, get a few drinks, get a hotel, uh, you know, clean all my yeah. stuff, like get some yeah. me time. So people will sort of fall into a trap where they take too many zero days or they spend too much. It's like a, it's a, like a common, common, uh, through hiker problem of overspending in trail towns, uh, which of course is intentional from the town itself. But, um, it's very enticing when you have free and unlimited access to food, when you've been eating, you know, trail mix for three days with, uh, with salami, um, as your only other food source. So, uh, it's, it's pretty expensive though, just from, it's not, I mean, it's not that expensive, right? It just, it is what it is. Like you're spending, you're doing, you're spending like a six month journey. Um, people will spend, you know, I think the cheapest that I know of, and I'm sure people have been cheaper, but are in like the few thousands. Um, and then over you like know, six months, a, over six months. Yeah. And of course you can be like way you can, blow that number up like that's actually a big reason why people get off the trail is because they get halfway they look at their bank account and they're like oh oh my god i uh i gotta go I back to not do the rest of this thing exactly <laughs> yeah well some people can work from home but i imagine the internet is terrible out there internet is terrible that's a, that's like a fact cell service you can ask, like yeah yeah you can ask my wife how many how many dropped calls we had on the appalachian trail and she can give you a nice right. friendly smile about how hard it is to communicate. <laughs> yeah. So these little mountain, these little towns, some of which are actual, I'm sure almost little towns and some of them are a couple hundred people. Maybe. I don't know. Um, exactly. Is, is that, yep. So, yeah. So is it like you just, you just walk into town, go to the post office, ask for your package that you had pre sent with all your stuff and then walk around, maybe get a beer, something to eat. And then yeah, go back There's out on the trail. Is that what people do? Yeah, that's pretty spot on. Um, usually like just people try to do a quick, like do, do all their essential, uh, essential like grocery shopping type activities. Um, and then get out is like the, is the, ideal is what people sort of want to do, but it never works out like that. Um, you know, a, a good example, just like a good insight for anyone who's listening is like, what does that actually look like? Um, when I was coming into, um, I'm trying to remember the name of it. Uh, it was called Diane's twist was the, it was like the best place ever. Oh, it's in Cheshire, Massachusetts. That's where it is. So, uh, I go in, I leave the trail, I hit road. You're actually still on the Appalachian trail. Like you see white blazes on the sides of telephone poles. Um, the first thing I do is go, uh, stop at the post office. It's a town maybe of like a few hundred people, like pretty small, but they have some of the basics. Um, so I go to the post office. I pick up a prepackaged, uh, a prepackaged box that I had sent to myself, picked it up, go put it on a table, um, take all the food out. I have a new pair of shoes. I have a new shirt. I have new shorts. Um, cause my old ones were raggedy and, uh, and ready to, to hit the hay. Um, as I'm sorting this stuff out, I see Diane's twist, which is this awesome little pop-up, uh, restaurant. I go, or I guess restaurant slash sandwich shop deli, I guess. And, uh, I order an overstuffed meatball sub. I order an extra large ice cream sundae and I just go to town while I'm kind of repacking my bag. So I'm throwing all the garbage out that's accumulated over the last four days. Um, I'm putting stuff in different pockets and repackaging uh, my bag. So everything fits well on my back and has, um, and has weight distributed evenly. You know, I get through the meatball sub, I get through the, uh, the sundae and I'm like, I want a second meatball sub cause I'm, just desperately hungry. So went back, ordered a second meatball sub, um, unplugged my phone, which I had plugged in earlier to charge it. And, you know, three hours later, uh, maybe two and a half later, hours later, I'm leaving Cheshire, Massachusetts and headed up on my way to Mount Greylock. Uh, and then I'd imagine that in these little small towns, there's probably a lot of like, it looks like homeless people wandering around, exhausted, <laughs> dirty, there were these, hungry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> decrepit eyes. Are they yeah. zombies, homeless, the... or through hikers? Yeah. yeah. Especially and that's that where point. the term hiker trash comes from. Hiker yeah. Trash. <laughs> get out of here, hiker trash. Um, <laughs> get off, my, get off my porch, hiker trash. Yeah. Yeah. A couple other things I want to touch on. Uh, I want to, um, uh, hear a couple of good stories. Um, first, uh, what, what kind of dangerous, so you briefly talked a little bit about there's occasionally maybe mildly dangerous people. I'd imagine things you got to watch out for are bears, obviously. Um, what other, you know, things might happen out there that, um, you know, are interesting. Yeah, people are always shocked when they actually see a bear because they're like, that's like most people picture like a grizzly. Little black bears on the East Coast are, are to me, kind of adorable and, and snuggly. Um, the only, the two instances you have to watch out with a bear is if you're in between its uh, mama and its cub. And if you're at a campsite that bears are accustomed to and come ravage, which is very rare. And usually if that happens, like they'll just straight up block off campsites um, because once bears sort of have that habit in them, they'll go back, you know, they'll confront humans and it becomes it can become like a bad situation. So rarely do you really have to worry about bears. Um, a good a good story to share with you is I remember I was hiking um and I was in, uh, and I was in, uh, yeah, I was in Virginia. I'm pretty sure. And I was hiking in Virginia. I was on this ridge line, and the way you can tell that there's a bear is you just hear like a crashing, crushing sound. Like all the other animals in the forest, because they're not like the top dog, they don't really have to worry, or they try to be like quiet. Uh, bears, on the other hand, are just la- like they're just yeah, like they don't care. And I just yeah, yeah, they don't care, right? They're like oh, whatever. Like I own this place, so I just hear like a ripping sound. And I'm like, oh, that most likely is a bear. So I like, I like stop and I like look left and right. And then uh, all of a sudden, like a bear, I see a bear and I I clack on my trekking poles and the bear like gets spooked and it jumps and runs across the trail. It's probably 15 feet in front of me. And it was like hightailing it out of there. It was like, oh oh my God, like human high alert, leave. And I like, my heart's beating fast because I like was 15 feet from a bear. And then I realized, oh, there's like nothing to worry about. Um, the bear is like way more scared of me than I am of it. And I take a few more steps. And then the baby cub comes sprinting across to find its mom. And then my heart rate spikes triple what it was before. Because <laughs> I realized yeah. I was on in between the mom and its cub for a short period of time. But, you know, really, if if the cub wasn't there, like that bear would like was long gone and, and really wouldn't have been something to worry about. Um, but rattlers, so like rattlers, you. yeah, unless you are in like, there are very rare instances of where bears will come to a campsite and they'll go after a pack, uh, like someone's pack and food and they'll like kind of snoop into someone's tent. But yeah, it's not like they're coming in looking for, looking for human no. meat, uh, really and, ever. And then like rattlers you mean like snakes. Yep, exactly. And because the trail is usually one of the like it usually the trail breaks up the canopy a little bit um people call the appalachian trail the green tunnel because you're like you don't really go above ridge line you're just in this endless green tunnel and there's always trees above you and you never like you get one cool view a day um but like it breaks the canopy a little bit so rattlesnakes will sometimes like sun on rocks that are on the trail um so there were probably three rattlesnakes that kind of blended into a rock that i came up on that uh that spooked me a little bit that um you know i i worry about something like that more than i than i would about a bear yeah yeah we had we were up in northern california uh hiking once we did the big trip and we ended up down this campsite was probably three miles down a dirt road off of the main drag and we went down there at the very end and there was one other couple probably 200 feet from us but that was it like we were way out there by ourselves and in the middle of the night, a bear came crashing down and was down in the creek and making a bunch of noise. And we got scared and we were worried it was going to come up to the tent, you know, sniffing for food or whatever. So the people that were 200 feet away got their stuff together and started packing at about three in the morning and left like while this was happening. And so they left and we were like, no, like they left us out there by ourselves, like way <laughs> out. And we were like, oh, come on. Like you were like our only, like, you know, 
our only hope for like help. And so that was like, we were really, that was really intimidating because you can't, it's pitch dark. You can hear the bear. You're like, is it five feet away? Is it 20 feet away? Like, is it going to pounce on the tent? You know, did we, is it the beef jerky on my breath that it's smelling? Like, oh my God, like you hear all these stories about, you know, one tic tac and a bear will come and, you know, attack your tent for tiny morsels. So make sure you don't have any food. So we were, we were pretty intimidated by that, but, um, that was yeah. the only time People- that I was ever intimidated. Yeah. I mean, it, it can be right. Like they're big creatures and they're like, they're spooky, especially when you haven't really come across them. And, and, uh, you know, I think black bears on the East coast are a little bit different than, than some other bears where I think they're a little bit more, uh, accustomed to humans, um, and had historically been hunted more and kind of have a different, different relationship with humans, but they also, uh, there's a lot more access for food for them. So they, uh, with, in some areas. So sometimes you will run into bears that, uh, that, that yeah, are, they, they go rogue. Yeah. <laughs> cantankerous bears. Um, <laughs> so give me a good, give me a good, like a good story or a, a, like a, you know, something that like, I mean, you've told some really good stories. Is there, is there any other experiences or like little stories or anything that you can share with us that, that you think would kind of enlighten us about what it's really like to be out there? Yeah, one of the um, this it's funny because this is uh, it speaks to the it speaks to the nature of through hiking, but it was actually with two guys who were running, um, and so I was in Tennessee and I was I literally bumped into these two guys who were um, trying to run like section run the Appalachian Trail, and um, it was pretty crazy because uh, I like n- hadn't bumped into anyone else who was actually trying to run because um, when a lot a lot of what I was doing was was running very yeah. very slow running you were doing 50 miles running. a day right yeah I was doing 50 miles yeah, a day which crazy. most people are in like the 15 to like 25 or 30 mile per day range um, and so I start running with these guys and we like strike up a storm I slow down my pace a little bit to run with them because they were going a little slower um, and but I'm we're just like all of us are so excited to have like bumped into a, a wayward soul similar to ours, which is exactly what through hiking is, right? Like you connect with all these people from crazy different backgrounds and you immediately, like within seconds, you feel like, you know, someone, um, and can share like more intimate details than I'd ever share with my coworkers at work. Sure. Um, or, you know, even with some of my friends just about random, random stuff. And so we're talking and after about like f- four hours of us going together, I'm like, all right, boys, like great to meet you too. Um, there were, They were both from, I actually don't know what, they were from the South. I forget what state they're from, but I'm like, I'll see you guys later. Um, Like so great to connect and we should definitely like stay in touch on Instagram or uh, email or something like that. And they're like, totally, totally like go string bean, keep it up, man. And so I leave a few minutes, a few, like probably an hour later, I get what's known as rhabdomyolysis. Um, which is when your body starts to break, break down muscle tissue because you aren't getting enough uh, electrolytes and water um, because it's so humid and hot out. And the way you notice this, the symptom is that like you, your like urine turns like red or like a motor, a motor oil color. And so I'm like out on the trail and suddenly I like, I'm like, oh my God, this is starting to go really, really wrong. Like rhabdomyolysis in some cases, it basically like can lead to kidney failure. Mm. So I started freaking out, you know, I'm being like, Oh, I'm in the middle of the wilderness. I don't have any medical attention. I like Google, I like Google web MD myself. Like, yeah, you know, right. I'm sure a bunch of people have done that. It's like, that's always a great idea. Um, to try to figure out what I can do, but it's like, I'm only carrying what I have in my back. So it's not like I have access to like medical supplies. So all I have is just like snacks and water. Um, and so the first thing I did was just find a stream and start chugging as much water as I could. And sure enough, like these two guys catch up to me and they're like, dude, what's, what's up? And so I told them my situation and they're like, oh, well, like, dude, we'll totally, like totally share some of the stuff. So they had like salt tabs. They gave me extra water. They made sure I, I was good to go and feeling good. And I like did start to feel a little bit better. So I was like, nah, like, thank you guys so much. And I just had this like really heartwarming moment where like, you know, I didn't have the salt I needed. I didn't have the water I needed. And, you know, somebody was looking out there for me, despite that I was in the middle of the wilderness. And so they go on. I slowly recover. I start walking like I start to 
have less and less of the symptoms of rhabdo and I start running again and I'm like, maybe, you know, these guys are hours ahead of me, but maybe I'll catch them. Um, and this was in like a hot, hot Virginian day. Like it was, it, I think it was 95 that day and very, maybe 92 and, uh, and, and very humid. And I come across another through hiker. I'm like, Oh, did you see two guys running? They're like, Oh, totally. Yeah. Two guys are maybe five minutes ahead of you. And I was shocked because they should have gained like an hour plus on me. Sure. I was like, that's weird. They're going so slow. And, uh, I turned like three corners later and w- this guy was literally like, uh, was barely conscious on the trail, um, passed out from almost passed out from heat exhaustion. Um, which was just crazy. And I, and I came across him and I was like, I did a double take. Cause I was like, this was me like five hours ago. And now, now this, so I gave him back some of the salt yeah. pills I didn't use yeah, helping and then looked out. out for him. Yeah, exactly. And his buddy had gone ahead to look for help and didn't realize how bad of a situation his buddy was in. Um, and this guy, when I came across him, like I tried to get him, he was sitting in the sun on the trail, like just like slightly lucid. I tried to take him out of the sun and he like cramps in like four different places uh, and freaks out a little bit. And eventually he starts taking down water and starts taking down some food. So I share some of my food with him and, um, and his buddy comes back and I explain the situation and that hiker catches up to us. And one of the people in their party is like a doctor. So we have kind of this moment where we're looking out for this person, this guy in like a really remote, somewhat dangerous situation. And, you know, after like two hours, I'm, you know, he's feeling a little bit better and, and we have sort of a rescue plan set in place for him where we can get off trail. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to head out. I'll see you guys. And I end up stopping in a trail town that night and cutting the day short because I was kind of traumatized. And sure enough, I bumped into these two guys getting a beer, uh, with this like little folk singer at this really awesome, uh, bar and grill, like right next to a little river. So we're playing this epic folk music, uh, like Southern country folk and, uh, and, and these two guys are just sitting there getting a beer and I had an opportunity to just hug both of them and like have this sort of culminating crazy experience where I'm like, we went through this psycho day together. Uh, and I don't even know these guys, but I, I feel like I've known them for a year. So that's what, I don't know. I kind of, I, you get a lot of those, uh, people just like look out for each other on the trail and you're in a lot of these remote situations, which, you know, makes that human connection that much stronger. Um, and, I don't know. It's, it's just one American of the stories way. that, yeah. you know, really, yeah, it's like, that's to me sort of like a, one of the most, mem- like probably the most memorable moment on the Appalachian trail where I got to, you know, just had this wild, wild day. That's awesome. Yeah. I imagine you, do you keep in touch with those? Do you still talk to those guys ever? Yep. Yeah. Still, uh, still talk to them. They do ultras. So we, every once in a while message about different ultra marathon races, <laughs> which is fun. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely still stay in touch. We're Facebook friends. So how can people find you? Social media, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, yeah. whatever. Like how, if people want to follow you and know more about you. Yeah. So I have, um, Instagram. I'm, I'm pretty, pretty avid Instagram grammar with the string dot bean. Um, my trail name is, is string bean. So the string dot bean. And then I also have a blog, which is the string bean dot co dot co. Um, and, uh, and also a fun little like Facebook page where I kind of share other updates as well. So, um, yeah, if you're looking to connect those, those would be the spots. Do you have any sponsors or anybody that you want to plug? Yeah, I, um, so it's kind of funny after doing the Appalachian trail, I ended up getting picked up by, uh, by Columbia, which is really cool. So, um, I'm an athlete for Columbia. Um, I also, uh, have a lot of, I prefer, uh, in like, I'm more in like the ultra marathon scene now and fastest known times are sort of what they're known. So I also work with this company called Morton, which is, is like, they were the company that helped, um, Kipchoge do the first sub two hour marathon, which is pretty cool. Um, and also a, a watch company called Koros, which is like watches that are kind of designed more for, for trail, uh, trail folks and ultra marathoners. And string bean is because you're like a skinny thin guy. Is that where that came from? Yeah. I'm like six, six, three and like one sixty. So, uh, and when I finished the Appalachian trail, I was like one forty seven, I think. Dang. Um, yeah, so I was looking. I would like fit great in a in a bikini. It was like major beach season look. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. 
No, I looked horrendous. I literally saw people and they're like, dude, you look, I didn't want to say this at the time, but you really looked like homeless on the, on the borderline of like death. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, well, thank you for not saying that at the time. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I appreciate you, uh, you taking the time to, to talk and hopefully, you know, people that are interested in hiking or just exploring or anything else that has to do with you know, getting out there will find this interesting because I learned a lot. And um, I know I asked a bunch of dumb questions because I'm not a hiker, but um, hopefully a lot of people learn a lot too. And uh, yeah, follow this guy. And uh, thanks again, man. I appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to, you know, maybe follow you and uh, maybe we'll revisit this again at some point. So thanks a lot. Heck yeah. Sounds good. (laughs) Nice Nice to talk, Nick. Okay. Bye. Bye, man.